I remember us working very closely together at that time when we heard the news that Bante died. And, uh, you know, Bante got into hospital so many times later in his life that you, you just thought, you know, he'd make another miraculous recovery, and, and this time he didn't. So, yeah, we're, uh, I'm going to be talking to Nagabodi about this uh, wonderful book, Sangharachita, uh, The Boy, The Monk, The Man. And as Surigupta said, he's here, uh, he's here in front of us. Um, but I thought I'll weigh in, Nagabodi. I'm just, just a bit aware of you in the room. And I know that for some of you, I don't know how many, but I know for some of you it's your the final night of your introduction to Buddhism course. Um, put your hands up. Go on. Okay. You, you are being introduced to Buddhism. <laughs> so it's the final night for you. And um, I'm sort of very conscious of your presence here because, um, you know, if I were you, I'd be thinking, well, who is this guy? Um, there's a book about him and the pictures and on a shrine and so forth. So I, I thought what we start with, you know, right from, before we even sort of get to Bhante Sangrach himself, um, but, you know, the question that occurs to me is, why do you need a teacher? You know, if you're being introduced to Buddhism, if people come along, they don't, they're not usually interested in a teacher um, or any kind of teacher. They, they, they might come along because they're interested in Buddhism and they want to learn about Buddhism. You know, why not just, I don't know, just practice Buddhism, you know? Um, why do we need a teacher is the first, I thought, you know, especially as some people are, are new here tonight, why do you need a teacher? Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me, for inviting me, and thank you for being here. And welcome to those of you who are very, very, very new to things. Um, yeah, how to answer that? I guess um, I didn't think I wanted a teacher. I um, was at university when I had, sort of by accident, uh, a very powerful sort of mystical, spiritual experience. Um, on the back of which, within a few days, I'd realised that God had nothing to do with it. Um, I tried to let him in. I said, if you're there, I'm ready. <laughs> nothing happened. Um, lying on a sand dune in Portugal, looking up at the sky. You weren't by smoking then, anything, were you? I, well, I, <laughs> by then, I'd, I never had. Um, or dropped anything. No, it was pure me. I'm afraid. Um, by the time I got back to my tent, five miles down a beach, I deconstructed Christianity, religion, and the need for a, a group or a teacher. I was absolutely convinced that the very nature of the experience, which I'm not saying was <coughs> the most profound thing ever, but for me, mm. it was absolutely convulsive. Mm. Um, the very nature of the experience spoke against uh, the very possibility of institutionalizing in any way what it was about. And thus I was for a while, though I read. I read and talked and found my way to feeling at home in the language and rhetoric of Buddhism. Still not wanting a teacher. And then working at the BBC was working in a cutting room as a, as a second assistant editor, very young, just starting. Where the first assistant editor who turned up to, be, to work on this project that we were doing was a Buddhist. And when I told him that I was a Buddhist, although I had no teacher, no group, and no interest in, in one, <laughs> that was it. It was his absolute ambition to get me to, to meet his teacher. And I literally went along to, to eventually, after six months, to a talk by Sangharachita to shut him up. <laughs> <laughs> and really, really. But he didn't let go. And uh, as a result of his pestering, I, I went to another festival occasion and on the wall saw a poster for a retreat and I thought oh a retreat I could do with I was heartbroken about a relationship that had collapsed and just feeling tired from work so I went on this retreat in Kefolds the famous Kefolds mm -hmm. and there was Sangrachita um, how old were you then? 1971 so 23 and how old would Bantu have been then? So I guess in 71, someone who can do maths, 20, 1925 to 71. What? 46. 46. Oh. Thank you. That's kind of Someone's away. <laughs> Someone's away. <laughs> <laughs> um, still life in the old dog, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, mathematically, <laughs> mathematically at least. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess what I learned from Sangha actually was, well, some, a disciplined approach to, te- to, to, to practice meditation, um, doing the metta bhavana, mindfulness of, of breathing, not particularly getting on with them, but recognizing there's a real challenge here and that there is a, a journey here. I guess I, w- I was what a lot of people might, might be in still are, a hunt and peck sort of spiritual journey. Went to here, went to see Krishnamurti talk, went to this, that and the other, dipped into the Tao Te Ching a lot, the Buddhist scriptures. I just took, um, I thought a spiritual life was about having moments of inspiration on which I'd then feed for a while till the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, Sangharachita through what he said and just the atmosphere he created around him, uh, demonstrated and embodied the possibility of a journey that had grip, you know, that there was something I could actually do. The first time I, I, I ever spoke to him, I, I said, and I've, I've recorded this elsewhere, I, mean, I, I can actually remember it because I must have thought about it so carefully in advance. I said, I'm at this stage in my spiritual journey when I don't know whether it's something that you impose on yourself or which arises organically. Mm-hmm. And he immediately said, well, it's both. Mm-hmm. To which I nodded sagely and said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, what do you mean? I mean, it took me a, a little while to work out that, well, you create the conditions through practice, through your lifestyle, through your friends, through your reading, on the basis of which, yes, you know, some insights arise and you gradually mature and develop, you know, that it is a there is an organic element to it, and there is an element on which you impose, if you like, discipline and a journey and a conscious effort. And I think that's what I learned on that retreat. That's what I learned from Sangharachita. And I think a lot of us were in similar positions that we were discovering through him that it didn't have to be random, it didn't have to be accidental, which didn't make it easy. Um, you know, success you know, in a way ultimately might be guaranteed, but you know, it was it was up to us to make effort. But there was this sense of confidence that oh, there's something to follow here. There's a path. There's a a journey, a coherent relationship between myself and the world, and this this the availability of someone like a teacher who could give it coherence and could give it purpose and direction. And I'd say that's therefore what Sangha actually became in my life. And sometimes it was what he said. His lectures, you know, really did impress me in those early days, still do. Uh, I listened to a lot of them again when I was preparing for the book. And I was just blown away uh, by just how much he gave in those lectures and his, what he, and his writings. So there was that. And the seminars that he'd lead for some of us in small groups where we'd really engage with him and with ourselves and a, a text. But it was also what he embodied. You know, he, strange, complex, you know, Surya Gupta said, strange, complex, not awkward, you know, hard sometimes to be around, as well as impressive. But there was, you just, he just transmitted a sense of, um, you know, there are deeper depths, there are greater heights to scale than, than you've, you've got to. He, you couldn't brush off the challenge. There was just an implicit challenge in, in who he was and how he presented himself, which, you know, by that, you know, having mentioned Krishnamurti, who had that kind of spiritual charisma, not an awful lot else in some respect, but, you know, well, <laughs> um, well, his whole thing was, you know, you know, there is no teaching. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just now. It's awareness. Nice work if you can get it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Sangharachita, um, in a way, was very ordinary. It was very mm-hmm. authentic. It was very simple. The first time I actually heard him give a talk at that one, my friend had dragged me along to. He was so simple, just telling this story about a. Tibetan caravan going across the Tibetan wastes, coming across the mantra on Mani Padme Hung on the mm. walls. It's a great lecture. Mm. He's just telling this story. <clears throat> but something in me almost started to tremble mm. of just being in the presence of someone really, you know, the French had this expression, dans le peau, you know, in his skin, you know, he was present and just authentically himself. And, but he could also manifest a tremendous kind of, you know, 
you know, it, you know, just a, mm. um, a challenge. No, I wouldn't say his power. It was just an implicit challenge. Um, he'd always surprise you, you know, again and again. You know, he seemed so ordinary, and we were bumping into ordinary issues in our world. And so I'd say something like, oh, I think we should do this. Or, mm. And he'd come back with something that made me think I hadn't even begun to really think about it. Mm. You know, there was just that combination <coughs> of clear thinking, um, mindful presence, and, you know, a, a level of insight. I can't say how much or how deep, but a, enough insight, insight to constantly make me realise I've hardly started or I've got further to go. So yes, that's what that's why he became my teacher. I hadn't wanted one, mm. I hadn't looked for one, but I couldn't I couldn't avoid him once once I'd met him. And you know, you've got you know And I would have if I could have yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well come a bit back more yeah. to your personal relationship yeah, yeah, with him yeah. in a minute. But um, you know, Buddhism is a two over two and a half thousand years old and you know, the, you've got all these different traditions. Um, uh, you know, I won't go into them all, but and you know, and, and it's a too big a question to ask. But what is Sangrach's sort of primary approach? Because you know that you know you can't basically even read all the books of Buddhism. It's impossible. You know, um, even the Pali Canon, the very earliest um, scriptures, they'd, they'd fill out. You know, you just couldn't even just read those. Never mind the Chinese Tripitaka, the the Tibetan um, Sastras and so forth. Um, so, you know, what, what does he bring particularly? I was just talking to somebody just before we came in and he was saying, well, this seems to be like a European Buddhism. Um, what, what, does, what has Bhante taught particularly? Because sometimes we, it's almost like we over-focus on his personality. We will yeah. come to his personality, yeah. but what has he taught? What, what has he brought to Buddhism? Because people often think it's the kind of uh, Bhante Sankarachita's vision is a kind of um, like modern uh, sort of easy access um, tradition, you know. I didn't say I was going to ask you that. That's right. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, at the age of 18, I mean, for those who, who don't know, you know, when he was 16, on the back of quite a particular childhood. Mm. But at the age of 16, he had a, an extremely powerful spiritual experience. Um, how deep, how long, how whatever, I don't know. Even his closest friend, Paramatha, says he never discussed the content of the experience. But um, he knew, on the back of that experience, he was a Buddhist. Absolutely, he knew that. And, you know, he already had been reading quite a lot of Buddhism, but he really, even at that age, just immersed himself in whatever was available, which wasn't a lot in 1940-ish. No. Um, at the age of 18, he wrote an article for the only, I think, English-language Buddhist magazine in the West, and it was called The Unity of Buddhism. And in that article, written by this 18-year-old who'd just been drafted into the army because it was a, the war was, was underway, um, he told <laughs> the English-speaking world that because the, most of the translations had been of the oldest school, the Pali school, and therefore promoted one particular generation of Buddhist thinking, Buddhist metaphysics, if you like, and because anyway, Buddhism being a non-theistic religion, among other things, the Western... Neuro, neuro, neurological kind of gestalt was not equipped to take on board um, a religion as different as Buddhism. He sort of warns the English-speaking world in this article, you don't understand Buddhism. You, you're not even psychologically, neurologically prepared to understand it. You've got to read more. We've got to translate more. And you know, the West has to go through a whole process of engaging with the whole of Buddhism and seeing its relation to our kind of lives and our world. This was when he was 18. Mm. I mean, the article is about 3,000 words, and it's a, a manifesto, and we're here as a result. Mm. Because literally from then on, I mean, he had an, a lot of his own personal journey, just as a Buddhist, mm. through various phases. 
But all the time, you know, his, his mind was in some way about how do I bring this to a suffering world? Now, that's the way he thought, it's the way he spoke. And ultimately, his project, when he arrived in England and made the decision to stay here, was nothing less than the recognition that in order to make the whole of Buddhism available, but in a way that was coherent, that was accessible, that did justice to the, all the riches of two and a half thousand years of experience, he would have to curate the entire Buddhist tradition and the entire Western cultural tradition and in some way, you know, more or less in the sort of, you know, the alembic of his own experience, turn that into a path people in the West would be attracted to. Mm. Oh, and that's the project. You know, that was, that's what he was about. And, you know, again, earlier I, said, I talked about being hunt and peck Buddhists. I mean, that, that was a dangerous thing because, you know, in, in here we'll, you know, we'll do a puja with English verses, mm. but from a Mahayana text, with mantras from the, mm. um, you know, the, 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 the Vajrayana tradition, with the refuges and precepts from the Pali tradition. You know, we are, we are a particular movement, but hopefully, as you get involved in it, it just works. You know, you, you, it meets your intellectual interests, it meets your heart needs. Hmm. Um, that said, we're at the absolute beginning. He did what he could in 50-odd years hmm. to, to start this project along the way. You know, and, you know, if we're interested, if we want it, you know, it's nothing to stop us just having our own quiet spiritual lives. But there's a whole project that we're, in, in a way, implicitly involved in of continuing this journey, this project that Sangharacha initiated, mm. of bringing the Dharma meaningfully, organically into a sort of naturalized place in, in the modern world now. Mm. And you know, I mean, I don't know about people in this room, but I mean, I've found the last few weeks so painful. I don't think I've ever been through so many moral and intellectual convulsions as I have in the, in the last two weeks. And you know, never has it felt so close to the, the pain, you know, of, of the world. And I'm not saying, oh, the answer is Buddhism, you know. <laughs> but somewhere or other, you know, Buddhism is one of the ways in which we can make ourselves perhaps better equipped to deal with what little part of the world we're, we're engaged in. And uh, I mean, it's an, uh, you know, I mean, I think Shen Pen Hukum on the back cover shout line talks about the audacity of his project. Mm. Um, it was utterly audacious. You know, you think of some teachers, very well-known teachers, think of the people you've heard of in the West, they're probably meditation teachers or they're people, maybe they're scholars, or they're people who are, you know, are you know, finding ways of um, naturalising the language of their tradition, their lineage. Mm -hmm. But for Sangharakshi to have just, you know, he just could not help himself but to want to offer it all, but in a way that could work and that people could naturally engage with and take advantage of in, in their lives. And I mean, it, I, you know, what can I say? I think he did an astonishing job for somebody who had 50 years, you know, from about 67 to, to now, you know, to, to make a start and point the way. And, you know, and here we are. Mm. I think that was the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it was an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think where to go now. Because we could say more about, you know, because the other, the other question sometimes people have is, is is our tradition sort of a pick and mix tradition, mm. you know, the, a bit of Tibet, a bit of uh, Mahayana Buddhism, a bit of, you know, uh, and some people have thought that. Sure. Um, so we could go further into what this tradition, its particular, um, you know, its particular form, but I, let's perhaps just keep it a bit more personal, I think, for now. Mm. Um, and it'd be good to just, I'd be interested to see what, what did you make of him when you first met him when you were 23 or whatever it was? How did you... What did you make of him personally as a, as a, as a man? You know? You've known him for, you knew him for, I keep on finding when I talk about Bhante. When, by the way, when we say Bhante, we always mean Bhante Sangharachita. Bhante means, um, means uh, 
Reverend Teacher. I actually, when I first came along, I thought it was a nickname. I did too. <laughs> I thought it was a. I, 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 I wrote him in another book, not this one. I thought anyone. I thought it was Bunty. Yeah. The guy I worked with at the BBC said Bunty. And I thought anyone who could saddle themselves with such a flaccid nickname <laughs> couldn't be worth meeting. <laughs> so Bunty is not a nickname, but. It's, it's interesting that we think of it like because it's partly it's always said with affection, I think. Yeah. You know, it's with a personal affection. Yeah. So it doesn't have the feeling of re- revered teacher. But anyway. So when we say Banty, that's who we mean. So what was it like when you first met him? How did you sort of take to him when you first met him? Bearing in mind I'd had this guy gushing into my ears in a cutting room, a very small dark room for, in Ealing for a very long time, <laughs> I was at first quite shocked. Well, no, I wasn't. I was, I thought, oh yeah, <coughs> this middle-aged man with hair down to here, rings on his fingers, sideboards down to there, <laughs> big thick glasses, slightly crumpled robes, you know, th- mustard-coloured pullover underneath and shoes. I mean, what the f- is he? <laughs> now, what is <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> you know, and then my friend introduced me to him and said, this is my friend Terry. And he went, oh, and just shook my hand. I think looking the other way, yeah, which was often his habit. Yeah, yeah. You'd shake your hand, not looking at you. And, and then, as I say, he, he gave this talk, and what was it? You know, just this story about these people on their ponies and travelling across Tibet. And something... Something immediately in me reacted to him, sort of instinctively, like, what's this? And then the talk itself, The Jewel in the Lotus, Mm. um, wonderful talk, do get it out and listen to it. Um, But I mean, you know, one one found out very quickly that he, you know, he, he had the robes which he wore for ceremonial occasions a bit, but it was very quickly obvious he wasn't a monk. He wasn't living like a monk, um, that he was gay, that he had a partner. I think he had a partner, but that, none of that was sort of in evidence. It didn't seem to feature. It certainly didn't bother me. Um, years later, when I, I talked to him about his decision to have a sex life, his, his answer was, well, you know, of course I could have carried on being a celibate monk, but then this would have meant an entirely different kind of order and movement. Mm. You know, and yes, I mean, yes, if that's how he'd continued, mm. uh, you know, I, I, no, I don't think, you know, there were those options, you know, I could have gone to Sumedha or somebody else, but no, mm. I, you know, he, he did give me what I needed. Um, it helped that he was, he was gay because, you know, he wasn't a rival. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, anyway. <laughs> 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 so, so that you know, that's there was that side which you know just um, I mean he was he was a, you know he was a sort of you know, he was a very particular person with a very particular personality. In a way, he was incredibly generous in the way he gave talks, led the retreats. You felt his kindness, his care. You felt his sense of purpose, and um, yeah, you know, you catch it. You know, you get a sense of the seriousness powering the enterprise. Even though, in those days when we were very young, very new, he was incredibly generous and almost indulgent mm. in the sort of games we played and how we were on retreat. How sort of you know, not half-hearted, but not yet knowing almost what our hearts were. You know, and our, what our involvement was, and he just very patiently, at the same time, you know, he wasn't he wasn't ordinary, and you didn't quite know what to make of him. You know, he, I mean, it wasn't just you know, some spiritual lack of ordinariness. I mean, he spent a lot of his life in India. Mm. You know, no, he did. He was, you know, he was affected by that. I mean, he didn't have any really Indian affectations or. Mm. You know, he would talk about his, his life in Kalimpong, but you knew that he was foreign, but if you like, a little bit alien. Mm-hmm. I used a term which he didn't particularly like. I described him as feral. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> now, I have to be careful because there's that word predator around. Mm. We'll and come I to that in a minute. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> but I didn't mean it in that way at all. It was more, um, you knew that he wasn't kind of working in the kind of within the boundaries, the tram lines. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean morally, mm. neurologically. He didn't mm. operate within, you know, predictable tram lines. Mm. And that made him really interesting, um, but a little bit hard to fathom. Mm. You know, he, it, it, it's also worth saying that in those days, we talk about you know, that retreat, 1971. And, um, I mean, you know, the, on that retreat, you know, the main summer retreat, the only, re, the only one of two retreats a year tr the FWBO had, I mean, there were about 50 people. Mm. You know, I mean, this was still a tiny group of people around this guy. You know, when, when people think about Sangrachita and so on, they, oh, he had this power as the head of a movement, but the movement was like 50, <laughs> 50 youngish people. Um, but he would talk about a movement. You know, he would really big up what we were and what we were doing, you know, which was exciting. Sometimes you could sort of laugh at it, at the, at the, you know, the audacity, but, um, you know, you, you got this sense of him having his eye very definitely seeing through us to a future that I think even then you kind of wanted to be part of. And it wasn't about him. Hmm. You know, he was a, he was a catalyst, he was a, um, a portal, hmm. but it was, oh, blimey, I want to be part of this. Mm. You know, and this it, part of it because of what I would get out of it spiritually myself, but also, ooh, what a thing to do with your life. Mm. Gosh. So, if we were to think, you know, we you need a teacher because you need someone to who who knows the tradition very very broadly and who can sort of guide people in what's the important parts of the tradition, what are the less important parts that creates a coherent vision of what Buddhism is in principle and in practice, not what it is in cultural expression. So, yeah. you know, you might think, okay, well, that's fine. You do need a teacher for that. You definitely need that. But do, why do you need to know about him? So look, we, what we've got here is, you know, um, your wonderful biography of him. We've also got his own memoirs, which are, you know, quite... Um, yeah. You know, voluminous uh, in his own teaching and writing. You know, I, I was thinking someone like the Dalai Lama. Probably most people wouldn't know very much about him, at least not in this kind of intimate detail. Mm. Um, certainly not someone like Thich Nhat Hanh, another sort of contemporary teacher. Would you know very much about him? Mm. Wouldn't you just sort of think, yeah, you're the kind of lineage bearer of the tradition. You're the kind of head of the tradition. And you know, why do we need to know about him? You know, we'll come to some aspects of him that some people, you know, find very, quite uncongenial. Mm. Why, why do we need to know about him? Yeah. And so um, I suppose I'm also thinking of people who are newer again, you know, mm, well, yeah. why, you know, they, they, they're not necessarily interested in, sure. in that, you know. Well, if you're new, then I'd say, well, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to, you know, mm. I mean, it might be interesting um, to you to know a bit about if you're if you're here, probably because you're interested in Buddhism, and this is a way of hearing something about someone who lived a very Buddhist life and a very broad had a very broad experience of the Buddhist world and, and Buddhist practice. So that might interest you. Um, I'd say that if you start to get involved in Sri Ratna, then to understand um, its distinctive nature. What what is it? Why? What, in what way is Tri Ratna distinctive? You know, it, it it's important, and he's the kind of key to that. You know, his his project um, of you know just seeing if it's possible to create this approach to the, to the whole of the Dharma in in an entirely new way to create a new kind of order that is neither monastic nor lay, um, mm. and so on. So I'd I'd say, you know, th there's that. On a personal level, you know, there is the fact that he's a controversial figure. He's controversial within the Buddhist world because he did go his own way in terms of creating this kind of movement. I mean, he, most teachers, as I said a minute ago, came here as representatives of their lineage yeah. um, and maybe started to introduce, you know, 
Western tweaks mm. along the way. Mm. Uh, Sangharakshi, I think, is the only person who, as a Buddhist, and categorically as a Buddhist rather than you know, an, an innovator or somebody introducing a new angle on Buddhism, like, say, Stephen Batchelor is doing. You know, there are the, these sort of other people with other projects, but mm. Sangharakshi was very clear. He is a dyed-in-the-wool yeah. core <laughs> Buddhist, but trying to, to bring it alive in, in a completely new and, in a sense, culturally alien context. Yeah. Um, so there is that project, you know, that I think it's worth being interested in, that he, he injected the DNA of that project and created a sort of template, a beginning. I mean, we occupy as a movement 2% of Buddhist history, you know, and sitting here in the LBC with his... <coughs> oops. Uh, almost wet floor. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you can think, oh, it's all been done. <laughs> no, but it's hardly started. You know, the, 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 you know the, the adventure of seeing how do you make it so that a Buddhist in the West doesn't seem like you know a, a fringe, mm. a fringe thing. How do you bring that incredible sort of tradition? alive in this world so you know that's that's why it's worth understanding him because he did the work you know he did the work to make the start he made and that was mm. his reading his reflections his years of reflection his working with us his testing with us using us as, as uh, not so much as good we weren't really we were kind of collaborators but more like we were his medium Mm. or his guinea pigs or you know we, he was learning as he went on how do you talk dharma with these people in this world you know so that's all worth learning from witnessing from and then there's him you know this this controversial figure what to make of him i mean there is still a weight of um of uh trope you know of sangrachta tropes out there of you know, of, of, of what he was, how bad he was, and so on, as, as well as, uh, you know, people also concerned about, well, was he a real Buddhist? I remember uh, the famous Guardian article that some of you may have read, which Madeleine Bunting wrote, which began with something about there being doubts about Sangharakita, and said, so even more alarming, she wrote, um, some people think he is not really a Buddhist. And mm. I, I, when, I, when I met her, I said, did you write that or did your sub-editor put it in? Because that language, the rhetoric, just, and she said, oh, I'm afraid, I, I, I wrote it, and she blushed. <laughs> and she'll see the colour of her face, but because she knew it was a sort of journalistic device. But yeah, mm. there are people who, who do sort of um, look on this project of ours, you know, as a, <coughs> as a controversial and, uh, you know, an illegitimate departure from, mm. you know, the, the orthodoxy. Mm. You know, which is a orthodox is a subject which Sangaracha engaged yeah. with yeah. personally and um, principially for, mm. for decades. Mm. So you've got both those things, and I think to what I wanted to write was a story, and I I, I made quite an effort to write it with a sort of quite um, driving narrative, yeah. so you can read the story, <laughs> but. Um, it's to show, well, how did this person go through a kind of life, the connections he had, the experiences he had, internal and out external, which led him point by point by point to come to these conclusions about how the Dharma could work in the West. Mm. And also, there was interwoven with that the personal narrative of a rather strange young man mm. Um, who was confined to bed for two years of his childhood, who was evacuated in the war and then conscripted into the war, who along the way realised he was gay at a time when it was illegal and not talked about in working, in working class world. Mm -hmm. How did this person, who then out of the blue have this extraordinary experience on reading the Diamond Sutra of all things, mm -hmm. Um, which is almost, well, is impenetrable by any other device than an intense spiritual experience, I guess. Um, and then, you know, what were the things he did, the people he met, 
mm. along the way that resulted in, in Sri Ratna. Because I'd say there is an absolute thread, but meanwhile in his life, he's having to deal with the fact that he's powerfully drawn to the renunciate ideal of the Buddhist monk, but when he meets Buddhist monks and becomes one, he's mainly disillusioned. Mm. He told me once that if anything could have put him off Buddhism, it was the Buddhists he met. <laughs> he, said it in all he said it in all seriousness uh, the Buddhists he met in the East you know, so many of them just disappointed him disillusioned him with their apathy their laziness, their lack of Dharma knowledge their lack of meditation practice um, he, he realised you know, sort of along the way that just on his own level you know, he was not exactly on his own because he would meet some people who helped him mm. But, for example, to receive a, uh, an ordination into a, you know, this is arcane for new, new, new boys and girls, but um, you know, he was um, ordained into a, a, a Theravada Nikaya of the Burmese school, but within a few months was living in Kalimpong among Tibetans and receiving initiations mm. from Tibetan lamas, mm. without any sense of that being a break or a, a disjuncture in his, in his spiritual journey. He, he took inspiration where he found it. Mm. And mm. You know, so, as an example, so, and yes, and had to deal too with, you know, working in the West, coming out of the, the, the Eastern world into 1960s Britain, realizing by then that it, you know, what was most important was not what your lifestyle was in robes or whatever it was it was how deep and, prof and profound was your commitment to the ideals of buddhism that being the case you know where did him being a monk come into the picture and stage by stage that was dropped and he moved into the sexual arena being totally unsocialized and made yeah. some messes but also so let's move yeah. into the Let's yeah. move into the section for you. Know? <laughs> <laughs> Fat chance. Anyway, um, um, <laughs> that was a joke. Um, I mean, what, what you, you know, you know, I know, I don't know Bante as well as you do. I, I do keep struggling with the present and the past tense with Bante. Mm. I, I can't find a tense for him because for me, he's still very much uh, alive for me. Um, but, um, you know, you, uh, you know he's, he's, a, he's, had a very, he's had a remarkable life by anyone's. Um, by anyone's judgment, you know, a, a complex life but a remarkable life. He's quite clearly a genius. He's a prodigy. Um, you know, he reads um, Paradise Lost, Milton's Paradise Lost, when he was 13, and ha he said he had the, the 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 strongest poetical experience of his life. Yeah. You know, I read it recently, and anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great stuff. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, he's yeah. quite he's a, pro a prodigy. You know, he reads the whole of the children's encyclopedia in bed for two years um, so you've got this uh, remarkable life and you know this, this very unusual story um, at one point in his memoirs people were people were saying that he'd actually made his memoirs up and um, I, I said to him all bunch of people are saying that you've made made it up and he, he said hmm that makes me to a very great novelist <laughs> <laughs> all of those characters um, <laughs> um, would be that bothered um, but yeah I had an experience recently and I've had this experience you know quite a lot of times you know since that first Guardian article that you referred mm. to Madeleine Bunsen's article um, I was uh, talking to someone on the phone um, I won't give all the details but he said um, so I've been uh, you know researching your teacher online um, and I've you know typed in the word Sangharachitra and I've looked for it and he had printed out all the things on Bantu, which is actually quite a lot, and mm -hmm. highlighted things that he was then reading back to me. And he said, um, so, you know, your teacher is accused of being a predator, mm -hmm. and um, your t that predation and that his sort of character has been foisted in onto a tradition and therefore kind of undermined a whole tradition that you're mm -hmm. part of. And then he said to me, what, would, what do you say to that? And I said... I can imagine you finding that concerning. Um, <laughs> so what would you say to that? Um, you knew him much better than me. But that is, the, the, you know, that, I mean, I, I put it rather, rather boldly and perhaps, yeah. perhaps a bit too, 
tersely, but let, let's embrace re, you know the realities around us. I mean, that is the that's what you're hearing. That's here. out there. Yeah, that, that, that the man is yeah. in yeah. some not very obvious way because it's often not quite clear what people mean by predation, uh, and that 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 behaviour of being a predator is a horrible word, um, mm. has been sort of bequeathed in some complicated way to our whole order and movement. Oh, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a, it's quite a small question, <laughs> and we will get on to something more cheery, but um, <laughs> I, I do think it's important to sort of touch on that you know, quite di- directly. Well, I, as I say, I knew from the, st- I knew, you know, from, from the get-go that he, you know, he was gay and that he was in a relationship, and along the years, you know, he was between whatever I got involved in 1970, by 1988 he was probably finished that, that sort of area of his life, around 80, mid 85, 86 maybe, something like that. So it was a period of his life where he allowed himself or decided, you know, just to say even allow himself, you know, it's falling into a pit because I think the stories around San Grachita, the atmosphere around San Grachita is partly coloured by um, you know, people's attitude to the kind of Buddhism he taught. You know, he, so he's immediately controversial and difficult for Buddhists just anyway. And he's been very critical of the Buddhist tradition. And he'd so. been, even in his Kalimpong days, yeah. you know, edited, created magazines in order to promote his commentary, his critical commentary on orthodox, a lot of orthodox Buddhism. So you've got that. Then you've got, I'd say, at least a, 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 a small amount of homophobia, if not quite a lot in some cases. Most of it based on, erroneously based on his friendship with a young man when he first returned to England from mm. India. He had a very close and intimate friendship with a, a young man called Terry de la Mer, which was not sexual. But because of the closeness and intimacy of the friendship, it was mistaken as one. Mm. Most of the rumours about Sangharachita were born then. Mm. Um, mm. You know, but he did decide, you know, er, come 67, 68, when he was determined to stay in England, that in a way it wasn't so, he was, it sounds weird, you know, I'm going to have a sex life. It was more, well, he decided, you know, he wasn't a monk, mm. and, and therefore he was going to let himself be himself, mm. and including in that way. And I think... He clearly made mistakes. He was totally unsocialized, you know, he because of the strange childhood he had, he didn't go to school even with his own age group because of mm. being able to read Paradise Lost at the age of thirteen. Mm. When he got out of bed after two years, he was put in two or three years ahead of his biological age, then evacuated, then put in the army. So it's like he'd had no experience. And his you know, Paramatha, his very close friend in his <coughs> later life said it was as if he just poured concrete over that side of himself mm-hmm. for years mm-hmm. and then, you know, kind of just, in a, sense, in a normal way, just wanted intimacy and thought, let's see what the, this is about. And, you know, he had some enjoyable, about four or five monogamous relationships and periods of promiscuity. He made some mistakes, misjudgments, unwanted, unexpected approaches. I think probably it's the unexpected approach. You know, a friend of mine who found himself, you know, being approached, found it deeply shocking. Um, and it's still, you know, it's still something he's, he had a long break, maybe some 30 years. He's back involved with us again. And in fact, I've heard from him very recently. Uh, you know, he wants. He is definitely wanting to join the order, but still feels he needs to pro- pro- um, process mm. what 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 happened. He nevertheless, on the approach was something he could res- resist. He just said no and, uh, and left. So it wasn't like he got predated on in some mm. predation. To me, suggests co- coercion. Mm. Um, I know people who um, I know one person who thought because of the sort of rumours. He thought that Banti expected that from people. <laughs> he went to see Sangharachita and he said, you know, do you think we should sleep together? And Sangharachita said, well, do you want to? And he said, well, no, not really. And Sangharachita said, well, 
Well, that wouldn't be a very good idea then, would it? <laughs> <laughs> so, you've got, I mean, for me, it's much more kind of measured. I mean, some people, um, you know, there's this whole report produced by the Adistana Kula. Mm-hmm. Some people did some research and did everything they could about six, seven years ago mm-hmm. to really put out a message. They wanted to hear from everyone and anyone. Obviously, some people have left the movement. You know, so, mm-hmm. But from what they could gather from their research was that there were perhaps you know, five relationships, maybe 20 partners <coughs> in, in a sort of promiscuous way, and of them, about five or six felt still hurt and holding pain from the experience. So just to put it in, whether that puts it in proportion at all, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just something to know, because um, one is too many, you know, I get that. I mean, for me, being around at the time, I never felt that I was in the presence of a predator. I never felt personally threatened, even though I was incredibly good looking. (laughs) (laughs) So, I should be serious, but, you know, I mean, it's hard to, given the sort of, given the sort of atmosphere, it, it, only I must sort of feel sort of awkwardly and unnecessarily defensive. You know, it just wasn't like that though. Mm-hmm. You didn't feel you were in that kind of world. You knew he was doing what he was doing and I was doing what I was doing. And I probably made my mistakes for that matter. But mm. it, it you know, it wasn't a world where you felt in danger of being predated upon. Now, part of your question was, did it influence <coughs> the wider community? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there is at least one case where probably it did because, you know, there is one of our centres where it went through, you know, a, a particularly... Um, I mean, the word I used was psychotic. Um, it's the only time, thank goodness, in our history that one of our centres has become absolutely focused around the charisma of, of one person. Not Sam Ratchet, mm-hmm. but one, one person. And that person also used that yeah. sexually. Um, and Banty was very the, concerned about him, wasn't it? I mean, Banty yes, and Banty was actually very concerned of, uh, about it and because I knew that person very well. I mean, yeah. I, can remember, you know, I can remember that. But, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, it's no, not, you know, I can say the word Croydon, you know, it's our centre in Croydon, which I had been the chairman of before it was taken over, by the chair was taken over by by this person. So I, I monitored it and followed it very closely and, you know, I mean, it still doesn't feel appropriate to write about it. But yes, I think in that case, that person definitely thought he was doing, as it were, hmm. a banty. He was doing a Sangharakshita. I mean, it couldn't have been less the case. Um, <coughs> Sangharakshita, I mean, in, in, in something I, I once wrote, I referred to Banti as being defiantly uncharismatic. Yeah. Um, in a way, he was, though I also have said earlier, you couldn't shake off, you couldn't, sh- you couldn't resist the implicit challenge. He was a considerable force yes, yeah. to meet. Whether that meant some people just felt they had to, you know, in some way... Give, you know, give up their initiative to him in that way. I mean, it wasn't my experience or the experience of, of, of any friends of mine. I mean, I have friends who slept, who, who did have sex with Sam Some of them in this room. Yeah, at least, well, at least one I'm aware of. No names, but... Um, <laughs> but um, <coughs> if he had, you know, was, you know there, was, there was an age imbalance you know, of maybe 20 years in some cases. But was there a power imbalance? You know, I, I said earlier, you know, to think of Sangaracha as being this powerful head of a worldwide movement would be completely sort of mm. to miss it. You know, in the period when he was sexually active, you know, it was not that kind of movement. But we are left with his personal, his, you know, his personal presence, the force of his presence. Mm. I, I wasn't mean, in I the remember, room. I remember asking him what you know. One point I was saying, you know, you, you know, you've always been 
the leader banter. Mm. Yeah. And, he, and he said, I've never thought like that. Yeah. You know, he, and I said, no, no, you, you have yes. been leading. He said, no, no, I don't think so. Mm. I've just been doing, I've just been practicing Buddhism and teaching the Dharma. He, he just would, he d- definitely didn't see himself as a, mm. a leader in that sense, at least in that conversation. No, and I mean, I did once put it to him that, uh, you know, and I was his publisher for 25 or so years, and as well as being chair of centres, mm. so I was one of them. And I remember saying to him that there, you know, it was obvious that there were people who he engaged with on a more human level, you know, and that probably included some sexual partners. And I, I, I just said to him, and I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't after anything, I just said there does seem to be this difference. You know, Sabuti had a similar conversation with him. And when I said, what, what is it about these people who you seem to just have a kind of an easy sort of, you know, friendly, easy kind of relationship with? He said, well, I suppose I just like to be around people who see me as I am. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think there are people who... I've got a friend who became a partner with him because he was gay, but he wasn't particularly attracted to Sangha, actually. But when the sort of possibility arose, he said he, the opportunity to spend time and to get intimate with this extraordinary person was just unmissable. You know, he just wanted that. Um, you know, but other people, you know, it, it's hard to say. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe some people, you know, went against their, went, went against their nature and... and, and had sex with him and regretted it. He, Bhante himself, thought that there was always a frisson in a sexual connection. Clearly he misjudged that sometimes. And I, there's an interview you can watch, it's in a, it's on a DVD, and I think it's online, I can't remember, um, where, where I really pushed him, you know, to admit that he'd made mistakes. But he didn't really, he didn't really like it in the, you, know, you can see the interview for yourself. But in the end he said, well, of course, I must have made, might have made mistakes. How can you always know what someone is thinking? Mm. Um, but I think that hurt him. You know, I don't think he ever sort of knowingly imposed himself on mm. someone. I think it hurt him when he, when those inquiries, as it were, were being carried out, and he was still alive. I mean, mm. I, I think it hurt him, you know, to yeah, discover yeah, yeah. that there were people who were hurt. So, so it, you know, the. It, I'm very aware, you know, that in cases, you know, in this sort of thing, you know, when you weren't in the room and when you're not a, you know, profound psychologist with an in on everyone's brain, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not in a position to sort of excuse or justify Sangharachita's, you know, sex life. I, I think, and in my book, if I come, if I come anywhere close to writing something that could be read that way, it's when I do suggest that when Sangrant should um, envisage the scale of the project that he was undertaking, creating a naturalized approach to what is the goal of, in, of Buddhism, what is, how do you communicate the Dharma, and how do you create a Sangha, when he, when he envisaged what that would involve, he knew he could he had to let all his energies run free. Now that, to me, sounds feasible, because he thought about things really deeply. He didn't do anything by accident. He must have thought about the decision Mm. to have a sex life, and he must have thought about the decision to have it within the movement. Mm. Um, You know, so this isn't to justify his mistakes, but I can imagine him thinking, no, I've just got to absolutely be myself and yes no no question he made some mistakes some people were harmed i mean the most vociferous critic well more than critic um it's difficult for those of us who were around at the time all i can say is that it's difficult for us who were around at the time who watched that relationship unfold over four or five years to read in the guardian or elsewhere the accounts that we've read it just you know, there's a cognitive dissonance that you can't... Uh, but how do you deal with that? You know, because, again, I wasn't in the room and I'm not, you know, you know I'm not a, a, psych- a psychiatrist or a therapist. Yeah. But it, it's very hard for us 
to see to to to, um, to um, accept you know those charges at, at face value and to think well you know we naively lived in this really you know sick world mm. presided over by a predator I mean it just so so wasn't how mm. it or he seemed I remember in one time when I talked about him about others he he said to me, you need to remember that I was born only two years after the Oscar Wilde trial. Yeah. You know, and the, the effect of that, and he, he writes a lot about that late, very late in his life. Yeah. But look, we'd better start winding to close, and I don't really want I'd, to end I'd, on can this Can I just note, quickly but, say, yeah, can I yeah. quickly say, um, that's something that I've woven into the text. It, yeah. it, it, it occurs here and there through the book, and uh, I'll be, you know, do read it and let me know. If you do, I'll be very happy to hear if anyone thinks it it helps or has allowed you to sort of, you know, just be with it. I'm not saying, as I say, I'm not trying to justify it or excuse it, you know, mm. how can you? Mm. Um, but, you know, if, I'd be interested to know what people think, so do let me know if you, uh, if you want to continue the conversation. Yeah. You've read the way I, I deal with it in the book. Mm. I hope I've left you to make up your own mind. Mm. That, that was my intention. Mm. So that's a good segue, so do... <laughs> <laughs> It's all been pre-rehearsed, and I mean, it sounds it's, it's natural. Uh, but it's a good opportunity, you know, do, do buy the book. As Nagaboli says, the thing that strikes me about the book is that, it, it, you know, it's, it's written very um, engagingly, paced. it moves, moves through the line. It's a remarkable life and a remarkable story. Uh, and uh, a wonderful introduction, not just to Bante Zangrachta, but to his vision of a new Buddhist world, uh, his vision of... How do you communicate something incommunicable to, as you said, an alien culture? Buddhism grew up in ancient India with a whole different universe that we can't imagine. Bhante was trying to find out, OK, what is Buddhism separate from its cultural accretions in India, in Ceylon, in Tibet, in Japan, uh, in Burma? What, what is it outside of all that? How can we teach it to modern people so they can go from... Suffering to Enlightenment. That was Bante's great project. And I think that this book is a really good introduction to both him and that great project. And it's a project, surely, what well, I'm very deeply involved in, but I hope you'll want to join us in. So thank you very much, Nagarodi. Thank you. Thank you.